Florida, 1,350 miles of temperamental shifting shoreline. This is an area where you can see geologic processes happening right before your eyes. Increased demand for coastal property. Erosion is never a problem until you put a line in the sand and say, this is where we're going to live. Predictions of more frequent devastating storms. Coastal climate change is real. Sea level rise is real. The natural flow of geological cycles. We are losing the beaches. We are just flat out losing them. These factors threaten to erode the foundation of a state built on the bounty of its land. There are a lot of stakeholders that have a vested interest in the future of our coastline. With so much already gained, a lot of money is tied up in those land resources. Will the risk of total loss be enough to save Florida's beaches? It's time that the state wakes up and takes a look at the Florida Beach Management Plan. Or will warning signs be ignored? Now that we have all this knowledge, why don't we use it? Until one of the last vestiges from our ancient past. What is good for sea turtles is also good for people and tourism. Is forever lost in our near future. If they don't have a place to nest, they may very well go extinct. 1,350 coastal miles, dozens of conflicting needs, only one place to go. When we destroy our coastal environment, we're destroying it for everyone, not just the creatures that live there. Higher Ground, the battle to save Florida's beaches. The challenges of coastal management policy are intensified by the number of interest groups with conflicting demands. Nobody knows this better than David Godfrey, executive director of the world's oldest sea turtle advocacy group, the Caribbean Conservation Corporation. One thing that, that I find in common when I talk to all, all sorts of stakeholders, whether it's beach regulators themselves, county commissioners, people who live on the beach, surfers, sportsmen, sea turtle enthusiasts, everyone's looking for some leadership. We need a beach regulatory framework that is as dynamic as the very resource that we're trying to protect. Beach nourishment or renourishment is when sand from offshore is dredged or pumped on to retreating beaches. Though renourishment costs millions of dollars even on smaller scale projects, it is currently the state's primary method of slowing the effect of beach erosion. It costs a lot of money to renourish beaches. Yet, if we want to keep the beaches and we continue our current development to a pattern in the coastal area, that's something that we'll just have to do repeatedly over and over and over. Florida's southeastern coast is home to some of the state's most densely populated communities. It is also where many of the most actively eroding beaches occur. You have developers coming in here that will build, sell, and leave. Pat Pasitti is manager of Regency Island Dunes in Jensen Beach. As another hurricane season approaches, much of her time is spent hearing residents' concerns about the alarming rate at which their beachfront is retreating and what will be done to manage it. We came down here not knowing very much, but loving the idea. And then the weather has changed and it's been difficult to live here. I'm not saying construction should be stopped, but the developers who do build should be charged an impact fee for future shore protection on barrier islands you take that and you have the state of Florida organize a good maintenance program on their beaches. Tourism's going to flourish. The environment's going to flourish. And in nearly a decade at Regency Island Dunes, Pat has tried in vain to hasten the state's commitment to renourish. If you've got people in the panhandle that are putting in seawalls and any other thing they can to protect their property just out of sheer desperation because of the bureaucratic process, it's time that the state wakes up and takes a look at the Florida Beach Management Plan and take a handle on it and maintain it. While annual state and federal renourishment funds are limited to only a handful of projects, new large coastal developments, some just steps away from beachfront property already awaiting emergency assistance, are being erected at an alarming rate. The sand is the way that you protect your dune. The dune is the way that you protect your property. But you've got to have the sand. 
Bill Pearson moved to Hutchinson Island because he saw the glimmer of an American dream on Florida's seashore. As it is with so many other Floridians, his dream has become something more of a nightmare. You know, this, this area here was probably, what, that three times as wide, this area out yeah. here, uh, plant life, and it's now shrunk to this point. Some folks uh, feel this is just trying to protect homes of people who are, you know, relatively better off than some others. Actually, we have all different kinds of people from all different walks of life here, and this is our home, so we'd like to keep it that, uh, the way it is and protect it. Between 1944 and 1996, the cost of Florida's renourishment efforts totaled some $200 million. After the 2004 and 2005 hurricane season, the state and federal government pumped over $400 million into beach renourishment projects throughout Florida. But the ocean is relentless. Within six years, it is expected she will have reclaimed most of the non-native sand. Get up into an airplane and look at it from that perspective. You can see how narrow it really is. And you can see that, that these islands move. And even 10 or 50 or 100 feet back from the shore, over time, is still gonna be an incredibly vulnerable place to live. There are 829 miles of sandy beach along the coast of Florida. Roughly 170 miles are managed or free from immediate danger. More than 55% are eroding, and 45%, nearly 400 miles, are critically eroded. CAVU is a nonprofit organization using the tools of flight and film to help communities protect their natural resources. Today, CAVU is flying Dr. Grant Gilmore along Florida's threatened eastern shoreline. I grew up actually learning how to dive on a reef that uh, I thought was a natural reef. It turned out it had been uh, hotels that went down in the hurricane in 1935. Those condos back there, they're probably going to have sand in their lower floors in five to ten years at the rate they're eroding. But someone built the house here anyway. I don't quite understand that. <laughs> Why would you want to build in harm's way here? Well, when we drive down past these condos on the beach, I tell my students, you just have to think geologically because uh, there is little question that water will be up on that hotel and that the groupers will be checking into the ground floor and that you'll have jacks up around the second or third floor and if you, you can imagine this underwater, which it will be one day, that there'll be tremendous reef diving along here. Uh, of course, there'll be man-made structures, <laughs> but there's little question the fish will be living in these condos one of these days. The average person that didn't grow up on a, in a coastal area is unprepared for the added issues they have when they move to Florida. Sean O'Neill lives at The Retreat, a condominium community in Walton County. Like much of the once economically stagnant Florida panhandle, Sean's area has witnessed an unprecedented development boom during recent years. Sean and his family live within a half mile of the shore, away from immediate dangers of beach erosion. But his home rests on property owned by The Retreat Homeowners Association and some of Sean's wealthiest and most influential neighbors do own beachfront homes and are currently faced with a familiar dilemma. The Homeowners Association here had decided to pursue a GO2 project as a way to protect the neighborhood. They were not able to obtain permits and even went so far as to try to go forward with the project without having obtained those permits. And were issued a stop order by the county. Florida's beach regulatory policy is one of the strictest in the nation. However, with issues surrounding environmental law and home ownership, enforcement is routinely stymied by Fifth Amendment property rights. This loophole has allowed scores of illegally built emergency seawalls to remain in place through the acquisition of after-the-fact permits. Seawalls can help protect property behind it, but it always transfers the problem to one end or the other. So your neighbor is going to get impacted. And the long-term prognosis for seawalls is your beach gets narrower and narrower, and, and eventually it disappears altogether. 
Caught in the middle of this debate is one of the world's oldest living species. Since the time of the dinosaurs, sea turtles have survived because of their impeccable resilience and adaptability. Florida is host to most of the nesting sea turtles in the United States. Until relatively recent years, turtle populations remained stable, but because of turtle bycatch from offshore commercial fishing practices like longlining, nearshore pollution, and shrinking opportunity for healthy nesting due to suboptimal habitats, Florida's three species of nesting turtles are now either threatened or endangered. Every year from about May until August, sea turtles are nesting on Florida shore. Uh, they emerge at night, lay their eggs in the sand, and then leave. The hatchlings uh, are left on their own to make their way back to the sea. Up to 90% of all the sea turtle nesting in the continental United States takes place on our beaches. So what we do to protect sea turtle habitat is, is very important to the survival of this species on a global scale. Sea turtles are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Because of this, renourishment and coastal armoring projects must take place only during the five-month period of nesting inactivity. But the rush to bolster tenuous coastal property has resulted in the armoring of over 20% of Florida's beaches. With sea walls in place, turtles often are unable to successfully nest and will return to sea in search of viable habitat elsewhere. Within a window of only a few days, she must safely lay her eggs in the dunes of a healthy beach. If none can be found, she will be forced to nest on unsafe escarpments or to release her eggs at sea, where, in either case, the eggs likely will perish. Sea turtles prefer to nest in dry, sandy beach, active beach areas. We know that those beaches have been overwashed. The sand has moved on a period of years. That is not a place where anyone should be building a home or putting any type of structure. Now that there's a lot of the dune sand tied up in development, that sand that used to go into the system and restore those beaches, we're seeing a conflict on a scale we have never seen in the past. Sea turtles are an indicator species. If we protect sea turtles, we're protecting all marine biodiversity. And in the process, we're protecting our own habitat. Over the past decade, Florida's population has increased at a rate of about 23%. Today, over 16 million residents call Florida their home, along with the 1,000 new residents arriving each day. With 80% of the state's population living within 20 miles of the ocean, a change in beach management policy grows more urgent every day. Well, right now in Florida, there are a variety of public subsidies that are provided that allow people to live in these highly vulnerable areas. They include repetitive beach nourishment, the ability to encroach on the public's beach by building seawalls, and even this complex public subsidized insurance system. The federal government actually encourages development out here. There's the federal flood insurance program. You can't build out here without it. There's FEMA money available when structures are destroyed to come back and rebuild at the taxpayer expense and not just the Floridians. Those people that live in Kansas and Nebraska and Montana, they're subsidizing development on the barrier islands. They may not be getting any benefit, but they are sh certainly shouldering the financial burden. That needs to change. We continue to subsidize infrastructure in coastal areas. For example, the building of bridges, which can only encourage more people, more development. Land values are great and there's lots of money to be made. So that development pressure clashes constantly with our regulatory programs. We need to restrict development on all barrier islands. It may be that we're looking at a period now that we need to talk about some sort of strategic retreat. If structures are there now and they get washed out again, instead of the federal government and the, and the, the state governments coming in and rebuilding, maybe we need to rethink that. Pay to, pay those folks or that development to get off the island. We have moved entire towns out of the floodplain of the Mississippi River. Barrier Islands are nothing more than a, a major floodplain, a high hazard area. Do we really need to be sinking millions of taxpayer dollars on the Barrier Islands? Go for it! <laughs> As home to some of the world's best scuba diving, surfing, and sport fishing, 
Florida ranks among the top travel destinations on the planet. One of the state's many recreational user organizations is the Florida chapter of the Surfrider Foundation, a national activist group that fights to protect coastal marine environments. Anybody, you know, surfers, beach walkers, joggers, they're not going to have access to this na natural resource that we have that's uh, protected by the public trust doctrine. It's for use for everyone, and when you have a seawall that butts up against the ocean, nobody can make use of the beach because there is no beach left. I'm a beach person. It's in my blood. I'm down here almost every day of the year. In the summer, I volunteer with the Turtle Watch program. This beach is protected by the state. It's public property and it belongs to all of us. It's pretty much in its natural state. But elsewhere, we are losing the beaches. We are just flat out losing them. The Florida statutes, they have some good language about protecting the dune systems and the beaches, but in actual practice on the ground, they don't live up to the stated aim of protecting the beaches. Permits are issued forward of the coastal construction control line. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many seawalls being built. They haven't caught up to the reality of a changing climate, a rising sea level, stronger storms. The aim is good, but in practice it just uh, is failing. The insurance industry has now seen, really, the ramifications of all the development. You now have 180,000 homeowners that aren't going to have insurance this year because the insurance industry knows that they live in a coastal high hazard area and, and doesn't want to take the responsibility for the developer's uh, actions of putting a home there. For the state to try to step in and, and pay the bill, it, that's not the answer. I'd like to see the focus change from insurance to investment. Kind of like the way I'd encourage folks to look at their health. Um, you know, you can have an awesome insurance policy, um, but do you really want to get sick? I'm a native Floridian. I love going to the beach. I grew up surfing on the east coast of Florida. And uh, when I see the beaches destroyed and the dunes destroyed, it, I'm emotionally connected to that and I want to do something about it. I grew up in uh, Florida's panhandle, so uh, I learned at an early age how beautiful the uh, undeveloped beaches of the Florida panhandle were. When I go back now, it's a different world. If we're not careful, Florida, at least its coast, are going to be ringed with high-rise hotels, residential condominiums, very limited beach access. It will be a, just a completely different state. Part of the American dream was you work your 30 or 35 or 40 years and you retire to Florida. Uh, a lot of that is still going on, but more and more we're seeing people starting to go the other way. When I retire, I'm going north. I'm leaving the island, I'm leaving the hurricane areas. Uh, time to go inland a little bit. I've got a four and a half year old son, and since before he could walk, I've been trying to teach him how to surf. It could be that he's not gonna be able to, to go out and enjoy the beach because he's gonna walk down and it'll just be a wall of seawalls. We could lose either one or all of the subpopulation of loggerheads that nest on Florida beaches. Here is an animal that has been on this planet since the time of the dinosaurs. And to think that our species could be the one that ends the existence of this or any animal on the planet. To me, that would truly be a tragedy. I, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't know. I suspect that.